Hi everyone, I am Mohammed from Northeastern University. Uh, today I will talk about uh, 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 translation layers for interlaced magnetic recording. This is a joint work between uh, Northeastern University and uh, Seagate Technology. So in my presentation, I'll first talk about interlaced magnetic recording, the pros and cons. So uh, just for the record, we call it, I call it IMR throughout my presentation to make it easier for myself. Uh, then I'll talk about why we need a translation layer on top of IMR. And then uh, I'll, I'll talk about our translation layers that we propose. And then at the end, we'll see how well they can perform. So before I get to the main slides, uh, I would love to have a uh, brief overview of the hard drives. Uh, so uh, um, a single hard drive is uh, composed of several platters that you can see one in the figure. Uh, each platter is um, composed of, actually it contains a huge number of tracks. Uh, each track is about one to two megabyte. And for example, a 20 terabyte uh, device uh, can contain about 13 million uh, tracks. So depending on the speed of uh, the disk, it takes about 8 to uh, 10 milliseconds to rotate. So we need this information to understand when, we, when I'm talking about the performance issues. So what is interlaced magnetic recording, or IMR? To answer this question, I'll do some comparisons between the uh, technologies for magnetic recording. Uh, let's start with the basic one. It's uh, conventional magnetic recording, or people call it CMR. So as you can see in the figure in this technology, tracks are located beside each other. Uh, a newer technology was uh, shingle drives or uh, SMR that showed up around uh, six, seven years ago. So the idea is to uh, overlap tracks to offer higher capacity. So they could increase the capacity by 25%. Uh, however, it suffers from a serious limitation. And the limitation is that no random write is allowed on all the tracks. So uh, because of this limitation, the performance is going to be uh, uh, lower than the conventional drive. Interlaced magnetic recording, which is the focus of this talk, uh, is a uh, state-of-the-art technology. It's still on the experimental phase. So again, it shares the same idea with SMR, with shingle drives. They track the overlap tracks, but in a different way, in a different fashion, as you can see in the figure. So they offer a higher capacity, about 40% uh, increase in capacity compared to a conventional drive. And uh, the cool and interesting thing about uh, IMR is that they lift some of the constraints that SMR has to deal with. So here we are talking about half of the tracks overlap. So definitely the performance should be better than a shingle drive, but the main question is how close we can get to a conventional drive in terms of performance. So let's get back to the uh, IMR uh, technology. So you can see a figure on the right that there are three tracks uh, located in the background and there are two top tracks interlaced in between. So uh, that's why half a track overlap and the other half doesn't. Uh, so one fact about IMR is that top tracks are smaller in size than the bottom tracks. So meaning that they contain less amount of data. So uh, I was talking about overlapping and half of the tracks are rewritable and the other half are not. So for half of the tracks which are rewritable, we got no problem. For the other half, we need to come up with a solution. Some sort of operation like read, modify, write could help or a translation layer can help to uh, address the problem. For those who, is, uh, who are not familiar with translation layer, it's a uh, layer that provides a rewritable block uh, interface on top of the drive and the device. So it can be implemented on the host side or on the device side, um, like the SMR that we have host managed drive or drive managed drive. The focus of this work in, uh, is on uh, translation layers sitting on the device side. So the, the, the constraint and the limitation that I was talking about, let's see what happens. Uh, uh, we, we've got a figure here on the left, and let's say that I would like to do a top track update. So as you can see, by updating the top tracks here, I'm going to rewrite on the bottom track, which is in the middle. However, you can see, because in IMR, the read head is smaller than the write head, I'm still able to read the middle section of the bottom track. So there is no problem with this, as I said before. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the case for uh, bottom track update. 
So you can see, figure, you can see in this figure on the right that uh, as soon as I update the bottom track, the two neighboring top tracks are going to be overwritten. And uh, again, unfortunately, because uh, the read head this time is not that small enough, I'm not able to read the entire section of the middle track. So data is corrupted and lost. Uh, to address this problem, the original paper of IMR uh, proposes read, modify, write very vaguely. So here I'm showing how it works. So let's say that I'm going to update sector S on the bottom track, which is in the middle. So what happens is that we have to take these steps. First, we have to read the two neighboring sectors on the two neighboring top tracks. Then we are going to update sector on the bottom track, data is corrupted, but there is no problem. We have copies somewhere else. And you can see the copies um, are in the memory and on a uh, persistent place just to address the crash consistency. And then the third step is to write back the red uh, sectors. So bingo, we got uh, not, no problem with random write here, but there is another issue. For a single update, I have to do two additional reads and three additional writes. This IA amplification translates to a poor performance uh, as all the steps there have to be, ha has to be done synchronously. So in terms of latency, each, ran each read modify write is going to cost about a seek and uh, four to five rotations depending on the IO size. So to see how bad it is, we can compare it with, a, uh, with, a, with an update in, in a conventional drive that only needs a seek plus half a rotation. So uh, we thought, okay, how, how can we resolve this problem? Our strategy is to move the data, the hot data from the bottom track and put them on top because on top tracks we don't have any problem for random writes. Then the question is at what granularity we want to do this? Do we want to do it per sector? Mm, definitely not because uh, it's going to use a lot of memory to keep that sector map. And uh, second of all, we are going to make data fragmented, then we are going to deal with a lot of seeks, and then the poor performance at the end of the day. So what about doing it at a track level? Maybe. So our analysis on the, uh, on the workloads that we have, uh, on the block traces actually, these are the traces, uh, block traces that we have. I'll talk about them in the evaluation section. Our analysis supports this idea. So here in this figure, you see the CDF of the write accesses to the tracks for the four different workloads. As you can see, the majority of writes go to the uh, small number of tracks. Here, for example, the first 100 hot tracks for the workload uh, W106. You can see 80% of the writes are going to that track. So Motivated by that, we propose uh, three translation layers, which we call track flipping, track caching, and dynamic track mapping. These algorithms should run periodically, every maybe every uh, 20k writes, 30 30k writes, which is going to be about a few minutes. Uh, in order to make the uh, overhead of these algorithms limited, we are going to run these algorithms for uh, a limited amount of tracks. So we can minimize the overhead. But keep in mind that we still need to do read, modify, write, because we still have data on bottom tracks, although they are cold. So let's get back to the ideas that I was talking about. The first one was track flipping. The, the main idea is to swap the hot bottom tracks with uh, neighboring cold top tracks. So you can see a figure, a, a track layout of an IMR on the right. I'm showing the temperature using colors here. So as you can see, track one and five are super hot, and there are good can candidates to be swapped with track uh, two and four in the figure. After doing this, you can see I'm going to have a new layout with uh, hot tracks on top and cold tracks in the bottom. So I'm going to show that this algorithm is working. However, it, it suffers from um, a couple of limitations and challenges. The first challenge is that, if you remember, I was talking about uh, track size mismatch. Bottom tracks are smaller than the top tracks, so I cannot copy the entire content of a bottom track to a top track. A simple solution for that would be to either copy the low LVAs or high LVAs within one track. Whichever is harder, we're going to copy that part. But the second problem is that what if I've got two neighboring top tracks which are already, they're already hot as well. So there is no improvement by flipping them or swapping them with the neighboring tracks. 
Uh, cost of doing a single track flipping is going to be around 3, 6 plus 8 rotations, but keep in mind that we are doing this periodically and we are doing this for a limited number of tracks. Uh, since we are going to implement track flipping and the other two algorithms in the firmware, uh, we have to be careful about the memory usage. So uh, for, track for track flipping, we have to first uh, take, uh, keep track of the track accesses. So we, we offer just logging the written tracks uh, within each period. And since the periods are not that much long, uh, we are going to have only, we are going to use only maybe a quarter of megabytes for this in our experiments. Uh, the other memory usage is related to track map. Uh, so each bottom track can have five states. Either it's unmoved or it's flipped. If it is flipped, it's either flip or swap with the right neighbor or the left neighbor. So I'm going to have five states at the end of the day, which means that I need to have three bits uh, per two tracks. So if we do the calculation, we, we'll see that for a 20 terabyte drive, I will need two and a half megabyte to store the track map. Uh, the second approach is uh, selective track caching. Uh, this approach resolves the problem and uh, limitations of the track flipping that I was talking about, track mismatch and neighboring hot tracks. So the idea is to uh, reserve a small number of tracks in our experiment 100 tracks. Uh, we are going to reserve a small number of tracks on the disk and we are going to make sure that it's non interlaced so there is no problem with random writing those in that area, and we are going to cache super hot tracks in there. So let's see that with an example here. You can see that track three and seven is going to be inserted to the cache, and track one, because it's right now cold, is going to be evicted from the cache. So the uh, cost of this algorithm is going to be, uh, I mean, an eviction plus an insertion is going to cost about uh, six, six plus 10 rotations. In terms of memory requirement, uh, we're going to do the same thing that we did for track flipping, so a quarter of megabyte for keeping track of hot tracks. Uh, however, for the uh, cache map, if we can implement it uh, like a leukocyte buffer, uh, the size of the cache is going to be proportional to the number of tracks in the cache. So in our case, which we only had uh, 100 tracks in the cache, it's super tiny. Uh, the third algorithm is dynamic track mapping. Uh, I'm not going to go to the details of this. I'm just going to say that this is a uh, more complex way of doing track flipping, which is more relaxed, but it's going to consume more memory. Please take a look at the paper if you're interested in this one. Uh, so in order to validate the three algorithms that I was talking about and also read, modify, write, uh, we ran some simulations. Uh, so we replayed uh, the traces that we have. These are the traces from... Uh, these are the block traces from cloud physics, uh, a virtualized environment. So the, these are the traces of VMs running Linux and Windows. Uh, so we also had a simplified model of the disk that you can see the parameters here. Uh, for more details, please take a look at the paper again. So in our simulation, trace inter-arrival times were preserved in replay up to a uh, maximum Q depth of 64. So to calculate the I.O. latency, we included that queuing time, uh, the seek time, rotational delay, and transfer time. So uh, here we see selected uh, results for right amplification factor. Um, uh, in comparison, the conventional drive, read, modify, write, would be one. So let's see. Uh, as you can see, read, modify, write imposes a lot of overhead. We are dealing with a, uh, with a large uh, read, modify, write, maximum up to 2.5, you can see here. However, by using our algorithm, track flipping, track caching, and dynamic track mapping, you can see we could reduce that write amplification factor to 1.1, which is very close to a conventional drive for the case W39 in the figure. Uh, the other metric that we used was uh, normalized, uh, was mean latency. Actually, the results that I'm going to show, they are normalized to a conventional drive latency. So again, read, modify, write. Here you can see uh, more mixed results. For some cases, the, the increase in latency was not uh, that much bad, but for many of the cases, it's really bad. For some of the cases like W39 and W56, you can see 
uh, we, we are dealing with a uh, horrible latency increase. So uh, our algorithm can help uh, read modify, uh, sorry, flipping, caching, and dynamic mapping. They, they can help to reduce that increase in the latency. Uh, so as you can see here, for, for the case of uh, W56, which we had a very horrible latency, we could reduce it and very, make it very close to the latency of a conventional drive. So uh, uh, in today's talk, I talked about interlaced magnetic recording, which is the state of the art technology in hard drives. I talked about the pros and cons, the idea of overlapping tracks and the constraints that half of the tracks cannot be overwritten in place. So I talked about read, modify, write as a classical solution to that. And I showed that uh, the performance can suck. So we propose three translation layers, uh, track flipping, track caching, and dynamic mapping that takes advantages of the flexibility of IMR and can improve the performance significantly. And thank you, and I can have your questions. Thank you very much. Do you want to start? Rick Ferro. Um, <clears throat> so when you're doing track flipping, you're going from the bottom to the overlapping tracks. You mentioned that the overlapping tracks have only 80 or 90 percent of the capacity. So mm -hmm. you have a larger capacity track and you're copying it to a smaller capacity track. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So what do you do with the extra data? <laughs> so, as I, so as I said, uh, so what we do is we, we're going to um, either copy the lower LBA, which means the top part of the track, the bottom track, right. or the high LBA. So either of these ends. So we are going to keep the other end in the, uh, in the bottom track. Our analysis shows that usually in a track, we are not going to have an even distribution of accesses for the LBAs. Most of the times, it's like a skewed to one of the ends. So we just need more memory to just keep track of each end. So we're going to double the memory maybe, but it's not a right. big deal. I showed that the memory oh, usage okay. is very okay. small. OK, so you're, you're not just mapping the tracks. You're mapping both ends of each track. Yes, exactly. OK. That answers it. Thanks. By the way, dynamic track mapping addresses that problem um, by arbitrarily moving the tracks around, but I didn't explain it because of uh, lack of time. Sure. Hey, thank you. Not a problem. Sure. Do you have any insight or inside knowledge about the availability of such drives? Availability? Yeah. Uh, definitely, <laughs> you cannot find it uh, on the market right now, and I guess that uh, it's on the, on the experimental phase, as I told you. Even when I was interning with them, I didn't have access to that drive. Okay. That's why we, we, we went with the simulations. So, so about the simulation, um, and the analysis as well seems to uh, rely very uh, tightly on the specific parameters, the rotation and the seek times. Mm -hmm. So do you have any insight of um, how these could be, maybe the parameters should be adjusted to, to these types of drives or how the performance will, result, will depend, depend on them? I do believe because uh, these drives, they are based on the mechanics. I mean, we are going to deal with arms and rotation, so it's going to be fixed. Um, you're going to buy a faster drive, it's going to rotate faster, so you just need to change the parameter. You're not going to have more parameters, but you just need to change your parameters. Of course. What, what I meant was um, whether um, these drives should have different parameters from regular CMR drives um, because of the specific uh, but what do you mean by, by parameters? Should, should they spin quicker or should they? Uh... Uh, I guess it doesn't matter for them because the technology is behind overlapping tracks. So I, I, I'm, on, my, on top of my head, I don't believe that we should uh, have some more constraints about uh, moving the stuff or rotating faster or slower. Okay. So thank you very much. This concludes sure. our session.